just to begin, I believe it was your grandmother that was influential in you developing a, a love for singing. Is that right? Yes. Well, I grew up living with my grandmother until I was about 19 years old, 18, 19 years old. And I was named after her. Um, I always had contact with my mum, but my grandmother was a big influence because she'd been a dancer at the Cotton Club as well. So that was definitely influential, yeah. Did you have uh, formal singing lessons at all? No. Um, I went to a singing class uh, once, and the teacher, I think I probably sounded better than the teacher. And uh, the rest of my learning was actually uh, in the school choirs and in church, which was my best teaching. Yeah. Who were the, the yeah, first in the who were the first professional singers to really uh, attract your attention? Sam Cook. Ah, oh, good choice. Yeah, Sam Cook and um, Aretha Franklin, of course, because we were like the same age, and I knew Aretha Franklin from when she sang gospel um, and played piano, and her father preached. C. L. Franklin was her father, and he was very famous amongst the gospel community and his daughter Aretha was known as like you know this whiz kid you know she was amazing so they were the two first influences on me now an early group you were involved with the Glover Tones can you tell us about that group <laughs> the Glover Tones was like um, we could only work on the weekend because uh, there were four girls and two guys and three of the four girls were going to school they were only 15 so we would um, go to these churches, drive all night to Maryland, usually, um, not Maryland, sorry, North Carolina. So it would be like five, six hours drive and sing in churches. They would take up a collection, and then we'd drive back home. And that was our experience of being on the road and pushing cars and running out of petrol and all <laughs> that. That was, But we, we were well looked after. Yeah. After that, you were yeah. recruited to the, the Alex Bradford Singers, and it was with that group that you first went to England. It must have been a, a big decision for you to, at, at such a young age to decide to stay there? To, to decide to stay in, in England? Yeah. Yes, it was a big decision, but I already had a, um, a record deal with um, in, in the 15 months that we were in, in Europe from 62, June 62 until September... 63 uh, we were only supposed to be there for six weeks I might add and it turned into 15 months and on the last week of appearing at the Strand Theatre in London a man a gentleman named Norman Newell came up to me and said he wanted to sign me up and he had been the man who had recorded Shirley Bassey's early recordings so I couldn't say no <laughs> <laughs> after you first decided to settle there did you have a, a clear vision of the career path that you wanted to take I'm sorry, I didn't catch all of that. When you first arrived in England or when you first decided to stay there, did you have a, a clear vision of the career path that, that you wanted to take? Oh, yeah, I wanted to be a star tomorrow. <laughs> you know, I mean, to, to actually uh, go from singing gospel literally overnight to re going to the recording studios, I thought I was going to be a star overnight. There was no doubt about that in my mind. But then again, when I think about it now, of course, you needed that kind of, uh, those kind of thoughts to keep you going. How welcoming did you but find... I didn't realise... No, go, go ahead. I didn't realise that I would have to pay my dues and do all of the American bases in Germany ah. and play the clubs up north and all of that. All of that was part of it. But it was great, it was great um, dues paying, that's what I always call it. How welcoming did you find British audiences when you got there and the, and the British music community in general? Were you quickly accepted as a, as a British act? Uh, in the clubs, it was, uh, there wasn't really much of a problem, and there were lots of clubs in those days, 1964, 65. It was a huge club scene in um, the UK. So that was i would actually never been allowed to go to clubs before then because I was in church all the time, and suddenly I'm in these clubs, and, and I'm one of the stars, maybe not the main star, but I'm, I, you know, it was just wonderful doing that. But when I got the sessions, that's when um, I started becoming more settled and satisfied. Mm -hmm. How did that first come about, the, the session work? How did that first come to you? The very first session I ever did, um, I met Dusty Springfield at a Ready Steady Go New Year's Eve party in 1964. 19, uh, 31st of December, I know the date. 
and um, we were all in there for the New Year's Eve party, and she was introduced to me, and she said, I heard you're that singer. Can you do sessions? And I didn't know what she meant when she said sessions. And uh, when she said, do some vocal backings, and I said, I'll try. And that's how it started. Right. Literally, like three or four days later, I got a call, and it was Johnny Fran's secretary, who was her record producer. And um, his, the secretary had said, uh, we'd like to know if you're available for a session. And that was it. So it was about January 1965. Now, when the, I did my first session. When the session work really started to come in thick and fast, were you concerned at all that it might take up so much time that your own career might have to be put on the back burner? Well, I mean, that was part of the worry, but it meant that I was actually earning okay, doing okay, and never having to leave London because doing the clubs, you had to travel, and I didn't drive, so it was traveling on trains and in other people's cars and things. So doing sessions was actually great, and that's when I actually really got introduced to the music business when I started doing session work because I met everybody. There were some other wonderful session singers uh, doing the rounds at, at that time with you. How was your relationship with them, and did you have a, a was there a real kinship among you? There still is. Yeah. Um, uh, in the early days when I was doing Dusty's uh, sessions over myself, Leslie Duncan, uh, who wrote love song for Elton John and Olivia Newton John, and Kay Garner, who passed away last year, and all the singers were there. All of her mates were there, and Sue and Sunny, and the Ladybirds, and the Breakaways, and they, we were all, Mike, even the Mike Sam singers when they needed choirs, we, we all knew each other. And everybody was like a frustrated soloist, but for different <laughs> reasons had gone into doing sessions. So it was a great sort of camaraderie. So what, what would a typical day in the studio be like in those days, doing, doing sessions? Uh, you get booked for a session and minding, you have to um, realize that myself and Leslie, for example, didn't read music. So if we got booked on the session, it was great if Kay Garner was there or Vicki Brown, one of the readers, Maggie Stretter, because they read music and we sort of developed a quick ear because we didn't read music. And in those days, if you were booked for a session, say 10 till 1 p.m., uh, at Chapel Studios, it would be with a full orchestra. Everything was done at the same time. They didn't tr drop in or track on everything. Backing vocals, uh, lead vocals, and all the strings and rhythm and brass, everything was done at the same time. So, And sometimes we had three sessions a day doing them, doing them like that. Was it frustrating at times being uncredited for, for some of your work? Yes, it always was um, frustrating because... There would be number one records that we were on and we didn't get any credit for it. So nobody ever knew. And to this day, a lot of people don't know about most of the stuff that we did. I mean, we did so much. And I think my first my first backing vocal on a number one record uh, that started getting some recognition was um, with a little help from my friends with Joe Cocker. People started saying, who are these singers, you know? But before then, we didn't get credit. Not on the early Dusty recordings. We got it on the television series, but not on the, the recordings. Well, that that so jo that Joe funny. Cocker session, the, the little help from my friends, your contribution to that was quite significant. But when you saw it go to number one, did, could how hard was it to stop yourself getting angry and not seeing your name on the credits? It was very hard, but in those days, there was nothing you can could do about it because that was the norm, you know. I mean, no one got credit. So, I mean, and when we did eventually start getting some credit, it was wonderful. You know, it was just so, so wonderful to to, to look on the album cover because, of course, it wouldn't be on the single, but you, if it was an album and you look on the album cover and you saw your name um, backing vocals, Elton John, uh, on, on Elton John's stuff as well, some of the stuff we did with him. Uh, we got credits, and it was fantastic. I mean, because mm. the album sold so well, even and we got paid, you know, minimal fee. It was always minimal fee, but just to know that your name to this day is still on that album. Yeah, great feeling, for sure. Yeah, you, you got to yeah. sing on some sessions with ex Beatles, uh, John Lennon and and Ringo Starr. Any standout memories of those sessions? Uh, yeah, John Lennon session was um, actually booked by Doris Troy. I don't know if you know who Doris Joy was. Oh, absolutely, she yeah. Wrote, um, she wrote Just One Look, and yeah. Holly's recorded that. And anyway, she was American, a black American from Harlem. And uh, Doris was signed 
to Apple in Savile Row. And she used to uh, book some of us for some of the sessions. And she rang us and said, can you do this session for John? Uh, it was like the next day. And, of course, we all went, yes, <laughs> no matter what <laughs> you're thinking, you're going to do this session for John Lennon. session was booked for 6 o'clock at Apple. We all get to this uh, studio. There's 15 of us. <clears throat> and when we, excuse me, when we arrive, we're told uh, John has decided to record at his house um, so there's a bus coming to, uh, outside ready to take you down to his house in uh, Berkshire in Sunningdale. So we all get on the bus, and uh, it's during the rush hour, of course, so we get there. And it's that house with the big white room we recorded Imagine. Ah, oh, yes. And we get to the house, and John's not there. His staff says he changed his mind and has decided to record it at um, EMI in Abbey Road. <laughs> so... It, but we have something to eat, and we're allowed to go around and have a look around the house and everything. So I saw that. I walked in that room. Thank thank you. And then we get back on the bus. So by the time we get to the studio, it's about 9, 9.30, and, and John comes down, and he's with Yoko, and they're both dressed in white. And uh, he says, um, I'm not ready for you, um, but if you need anything, there's, plenty, there's food, the canteen is open, anything you want, just camp out, which is what we did, all 15 of us still. <laughs> Um, and he's upstairs in the studio with Phil Spector and Alan Klein, and there's a massive argument going on that we can see up in the control box. Eventually, after about two and a half hours, he came down and said, this is what I want you to sing, which is what we sang on Power to the People. Yeah. And we finished at about, I guess, about 12, 31 o'clock, and the next day, Doris Troy phoned us and said, honey, your money is ready. We didn't have to wait. We got paid the next day, which knocked us all out because at that time you had to wait for checks and things to be sent. Wow. So that was a memorable session. And yeah. Ringo's session was memorable in that George Harrison produced it. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> as well as I did the session uh, for Billy Preston, and George Harrison produced that as well with myself and Doris Troy and Billy doing the backing vocals. And it was uh, who, Billy on piano, Klaus Vorman on bass, Ginger Baker on drums, and Eric Clapton on guitar. And that was, that's the way God planned it. Ah, classic recording, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Who were your favourites to work with? Who did you know when you you're going into the studio to work with them, you, you know you're in for a good time? In those days, in the session days? Yeah, yeah. Is that what you mean? Yes, yes. It was usually Kay and, and Leslie because we were together so much. We literally were... Um, we were always together, so it was always great. And, and Sue and Sonny, we did a lot of stuff in choir stuff in the UK, but Sue and Sonny and I would go over to Germany and do, um, in the early 70s, we did all the Dom Donna Summer stuff in Germany. And that was great because we had a completely different sound. Each, three different girls would sound different, you know, and then you could mix and match them, and they all, always sounded different. And Sue and Sonny and I, if you listen to some of the Donna Summer backing vocals, it was so tight. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so it wasn't like um, there was nobody, there was no one that I disliked. My favorites were definitely Leslie and Kay and Sue and Sonny. And Vicki Brown, Vicki Brown, oh, that was my best mate. And she was one of the breakaways. Was it a, a great a great learning experience for for you working in in the studio and being able to witness firsthand other artists going about their work? Yes, because a lot of people uh, we would hear this stuff and we just think, oh God, who is this? Or oh, what is this? Or oh, or this is going to be a big hit. You can tell. You could tell. Mm. You knew it was going to going to be a hit. You know, we did we did something. Uh, have you ever heard of Long John Baldry? Oh yes, yeah. Long John Baldry, we were booked for a session for him, and it was a song we thought wouldn't wouldn't do nothing. We just didn't believe it. And it was called Let the Heartaches Begin, and it got to number one and stayed there for about four weeks. <laughs> How wrong can you be? <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, talk about Blue Mink. How did that uh, outfit come together? We knew each other there again from studios, because we used to see each other in studios all the time. Everybody in the studio world in, in, in London basically knew each other, even string players, you know, because we all saw each other, because most of the time everything was recorded at the same time. And I got a call from Roger Coulomb, who was the keyboard player for Blue Mink, and he said, um, 
uh, we've done this album and it's instrumental and we want to put some vocals on because we think it might be a bit boring will you come along and do some vocals I said yes and I went along just just turning up to you know it wasn't like oh you'll get paid for this it wasn't that kind of situation it was would you come along yeah okay and I did it and then two days later they called me again and he said uh, Roger Cook has written the song we think it might be good as a duet you fancy coming along I did it again went into Morgan Studios this was in October 1969, and we recorded a Melting Pot. After three takes, they said, we might put this out as a single, do you fancy joining the band? And that's exactly how it happened. <laughs> so it was never initially meant to be an ongoing band? No. Wow. Never. And we were together for four and a half years on the road after that. <laughs> was Melting Pot <laughs> one, one of those songs that you knew was going to be hit the first time you heard it? When we heard it, it was it was sort of tongue in cheek, and we thought, you know, at the time, it was like, why not? <laughs> Let's see how far it goes, and, and it went further than we expected it to. And suddenly, all of us session people had to um, try to do sessions as well as jump in the cars and drive up the motorways to do these clubs, which that was the main. Um, sort of entertainment was the clubs up north so we did a lot of that and we we went to New Zealand even because we had a big hit record in New Zealand by the devil I was tempted it was huge and we did a big tour in New Zealand would you believe Amazing. so I've been as far as in the car hill <laughs> <laughs> so what what brought about the yes. <laughs> what what uh, brought about the split of uh, blooming after those four years well, we had four and a half years, and we're all still friends, the, the ones who are still remaining. We just lost the drummer, Barry Morgan, so um, there's only uh, four original members left. And I've seen uh, one, two, three, four of them, actually, in the past year. And we're all friends, still. We're all still friends, you know, because we just sort of figured, we, we sort of grew up together, and we were like brothers and, and sister. You know, and for a while, I was the only female. So, I mean, I had five big brothers which was great. <laughs> so we're, we're all still friends, you know. There's, uh, in fact, most of the people that I knew in those days I'm still friends with. I've still got so many old friends. And, and the only unfortunate thing is the only time we see each other now is at funerals, and you would think we hadn't, we'd seen each other like two days ago. Yeah. Because we're all, we've all been in that situation. Musicians and singers are, are different from normal people. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you're, you're based in Spain these days. What, what initiated your move there? Well, my husband and I, I sound, I sound like the queen. <laughs> my husband and I came down here in 1980 for a holiday at Easter time. And then we came back again and decided to just go and have a look at some of the houses and decided to buy the only house we could afford, which was a one-bedroom house. And that was in 1980. And we decided about 10 years ago that we wanted to be warmer. So um, we just sort of sold up in England and came down here for, on a permanent basis. Yeah. You're doing a, a lot of jazz orientated work in, in recent times. Is that a music form that you've always had a love for? Well, I grew up listening to it. You yeah. know, a lot of the stuff that I do now, I heard when I was, uh, you know, my grandmother and her friends would be in the other room singing all of this Duke Ellington stuff. So I grew up with it. And I've reached this sort of stage in my life where that's the kind of music that really is is more my type and really is expected of me now you know i can't really go around singing pop songs the only pop song that i really do is melting pot i still have to do that i had to sing it last week a cappello because i didn't have the music for it and oh, the wow. audience insisted on it <laughs> so i me and the audience sang it <laughs> oh wonderful great. now talk about some other projects you've been involved with recently three divas can you tell us about that that was, oh, that was four years ago. That was myself. The first time was myself, Sheila Ferguson from The Three Degrees, mm -hmm. and Ruby Turner. And then I did it again um, with uh, Sheila, myself, and P.P. P. Arnold. Oh, yeah. And that, but the last, I think that was about four years ago. And That was good. It was with the BBC Big Band, which is... Which is great. Those are my some more brothers. <laughs> <laughs> and what what sort of material were you were you covering there? 
well, I mean, what I'm basically, um, Ben, for the three divas, we did diva songs like uh, Nina Simone, Peggy, oh, and right, yeah. Ella Fitzgerald. Um, that's, that was the idea of it, like these three divas are singing divas songs. And um, But, I mean, when I do big band stuff now, which is, is quite often, um, I work with so many different bands. Um, we usually do some new stuff as well. I've got a couple of um, songs uh, from Georgie Fame, which is great, and stuff that um, he and I projected, he and I did 20 years ago or more with Steve Gray. And uh, both of us do some of the stuff from that on our own separate concerts. And... Uh, a couple, two years ago, three years ago, when the film Ray came out, I did the um, promotional tour for the movie with the jazz orchestra from the Concertgebouw in Amsterdam. And we did about 12 concerts in the cinemas, myself and the full 18-piece orchestra. So um, we did all, and it was all like Ray Charles' songbook. Oh, wow. Um, so, I mean, yeah. And um, today, finalized flights and everything for jazz festival in um where am i hanover first and then in stuttgart in june hanover in april and may stuttgart in june and uh frankfurt in june and last week <laughs> i mean i'm really pleased because i work more now than i ever did yeah. <laughs> last week uh, my husband and i were in a place called dania which is between alicante and valencia oh wow and we we did because it's about seven hours drive for us so we drove up which was wonderful coast you know you had the mediterranean on your side all the way up and all the way down it was just great and uh, we did two nights in this uh, huge complex called monte pego in denia uh, and it was the first time i used a five-piece spanish band who were wonderful it was so fantastic to hear these the Spanish guitarists, you know, known for like uh, flamenco or Valenciana music, playing Chuck Berry. <laughs> we were doing uh, get uh, <laughs> um, jailhouse rock, and and it was fantastic. And the keyboard player doing um, Great Balls of Fly Fire, doing. I mean, because you you have to give the audience what they want, especially if it's a, a multinational audience. Yeah, yeah. So it was like mostly Dutch and German and and Spanish and. So you have to do stuff that people know, and the band was wonderful. So I'm really sort of content with myself at the moment. Fantastic. Anything uh, on the recording front uh, coming up for you? Um, well, probably at the end of this year, um, um, I might do a recording um, because I'm doing a, it's um, it's not it's heavily penciled a tour in January, February, in Holland again, but this is with a different band that I work with. Um, this is a guy named Dolf de Vries, and we're on YouTube, if you're interested. And um, we, I really like working with him, and he's actually the first guy I worked with a lot in the early 90s and was asked to do a tour. And then when we did do the tour, he wasn't the one the promoter chose. So uh, I, I feel like I have to do this, this tour with him because I love him so much and we work together so much and it'd be nice to do like three weeks. We're going to be on the road for about three weeks based in Amsterdam, Wonderful. which isn't a bad thing either. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> and before I let you go, for someone who's survived in the music industry for as long as you have, what would be your best bit of career advice you could give to a, a, a young musician starting out? Persevere. Yeah? You have to... You get knocked down so much in in the business. You have to, I mean, I still get knocked down, but you still have to persevere. If you want to do it, if you're a musician and you know that you're good or you, and, and you just keep at it, that you're going to keep getting better and better. Um, you just got to persevere. There's nothing else you can do. I can't offer any other advice. Um, and I think you, sh you should really be your, your, your best critic because you should know when you're really bad. Mm. or you've done something you're never ever going to be perfect no one ever will be no one is ever pleased with their performance but um you should know when you're bad and then when you know that you've really been bad whatever it is you should improve try and improve on it but you've got to persevere wonderful advice madeline thank you so much yeah, for your my time. husband just said sorry my husband is sitting next to me and he's a musician as well and uh -huh. he just said what we always say your last show was your best show ah very good <laughs> 
Madeline, thank you so your much. Your last show might be your last you show. It could be too. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's been a pleasure catching up with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your contribution to some of the greatest recordings of all time. Oh, thank you. Where are you based? In Melbourne, Australia. I've I've only ever been to Australia once. Oh. And that was in when was it? 1982. And I was in Sydney, of course. Yeah. Uh, working at a club in in Sydney in Kings Cross, and then we travelled up to Newcastle for a wedding. Oh, right. And that was it. I've never, ever seen any other parts of Australia, and I'd love to, but I guess that'll never happen. <laughs> oh, you never know. You never know. We'll certainly, never know. We'll certainly be here waiting for you anyway. Okay. Thanks a lot, Madeline. You take care. You too. All the best. And have a fair dinkum day. Oh, we'll have a fair dinkum day. <laughs> okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.